So let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for, well, <coughs> even, even as we, you know, we talk about something tragic with, with uh, June's son, Matt, we still, I sense a peace in the room, a peace that passes all understanding. I pray, God, that that would remain as we reflect on our lives through the lens of your word and that we would find your, your purpose in our lives beyond anything else. And we ask that you would help us, Lord, to set everything aside, everything that has happened, all the puppies, and everything that is waiting for us this week, whether work or school or situations, maybe health appointments, Whatever it is, we set it aside and we place ourselves right here to feed on your word. Thank you for, for the people gathered here in the room and online. Let your presence fill us all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter 1. This is, I'm going to tell you right now, you'll want to, especially if you're online, you, you, I can tell if somebody leaves the room. I'll tell you to sit down because the end of this is so profound. But if you're online, you can't see you leave. So you want to stay to the end. We're, this is a very familiar passage of scripture. First Peter chapter one. We're going to look at verse six and seven. I, I quote this all the time. And I've been pondering it. Uh, my, my, the subject for this morning is purpose for the trial purpose for the trial and I've looked at this so many times as I pondered it all week I thought I'm going to go back to this reference and then I, I, I we're going to take a lens out a little bit at the very end and you're going to see something that maybe you've seen but I've never seen before in all my years serving the Lord and it is exciting 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7 says this, For a little while you may have had to suffer griefs in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed when Jesus Christ is revealed isn't it always good when whatever you're going through Jesus reveals himself and says either here's why or it's okay I'm gonna give you the peace that passes all understanding because I'm gonna turn everything around for good even this situation with Matt when Jesus when you're convinced that Jesus is saying is true to his word and says, I'm gonna turn it all around for good. If I had a luxury car, like a Ferrari or a Maserati, or even those brand new Corvettes, they, I drove by one, uh, the, I think it was yesterday, and I thought, man, it looks like a spaceship. And those things, the technology behind them are absolutely amazing. If you ever saw one at the bottom of the ocean, it's worthless, absolutely worthless. Try to sell it. I think it's a quarter million dollar car. You go ahead and try to sell it. Even if it was at the bottom of the Thames River right here, go ahead and try to sell it. It's worthless. If I, you know those luxury cruise lines and they have all these state rooms and I don't know if you've ever been in one, but it, I mean, they are, there's a reason the ticket prices are so high. They got to pay to build these things and they're they're like multi 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 million dollar things if if we put one of those on king street and it was tilted over would you want a room useless absolutely useless these million dollar things whenever something isn't being used to what it was created to be, it's being abused, ab-used. It's being used wrong. 
it's being abused. When you're using something below its purpose, if I took this laptop and just decided, well, I'm not gonna stream online because I really want that door open, so I'm gonna prop it open with the laptop. Well, I'm abusing the laptop. We, have, we abuse people in the same way. When you're using them, when you're, in a, when you're in a marriage relationship and all you're wanting is for, okay, the, the man just wants the woman to cook and clean and, and make sure that there's dinner on the table and everything. Well, that's, that's abusive, isn't it? Because you're now using that spouse below what their purpose is, even as a spouse. A suitable helper, the Lord said, I'm gonna give you a suitable helper. And a big part of that suitable helping is to train each other on, on, on how, to, how to be a believer and who God is. Using a child below their purpose. That's when it becomes abusive. Abusive isn't just what, you know, a physical thing. Abuse is when you're using anybody or anything below its purpose. Today I want to talk to you about the purpose for trials. And the reason some of you feel like your trials are abusive is because you're not seeing the purpose for the trial. The trial has been created for a reason, has been brought to you, and these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, that's greater worth than gold, may result in praise, glory, and honor. There is purpose. And so what I want to do is look at your purpose so that you can turn it from being something abusive to something useful. The first thing, and it's right in our text, is to produce faith. Whenever you have something that's bigger than you, and we call it a trial, that's when we, that's when we come to God. That's when we really pray. That's when we really grab hold of him. Like Jacob at Bethel, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I will not let you go until you bring my son back. I will not let you go until you heal me. I will not let you pray so much more intensely than when things, everything's going well. And you say, good morning, Lord. That's all you got to say to me this morning? Good morning, Lord. Let me give you something for us to talk about. <laughs> And so it produces faith, and not faith in faith, but faith in God. Not in your ability, you, you, you're having faith to be able to conjure up this belief. You, you know what I mean by that? Do I have enough faith? Do, do I, 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 I? No, no, no. Faith is not about you. Faith is about, faith is not what you think or what you feel. It's what you know. And I know what the Bible says, that God is able. God is able. God is there with that loved one, even though we're in this room. God is, is in my body. And he knows he knit me together in my mother's room. God is in my finances. God is in, you know, understanding all my the possessions and what, what I'm needing and what I'm not needing. What's distracting me? The trials bring you back to paying attention to God, even if at first it's complaining. He, I, think, I think God would rather hear a complaint than silence. You know, as a parent, I, I hate it when, when, when my child isn't speaking to me, and that hasn't happened very often. I'd rather them come to me and say, Dad, I'm a little, a little disappointed in you. Okay, well, let's talk. Much rather that. So it teaches you, faith teaches you to live from the inside out. I'm not going to let my exterior circumstances, my diagnosis, my, my situation, whatever it is, I'm not going to let it affect me. I am going to connect with the Spirit of God, and that is going to affect my diagnosis in my situation, and my relationships, living from the inside out. The other thing that a trial will do is it can promote you. L look at this. Um, 
take a little detour, put a, put a thumbtack in the, in the first Peter one and go to Joshua chapter one. Joshua chapter one, right at the beginning. Talk about a trial. The title in my Bible is Joshua is installed as a leader. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses aside, Moses, my servant is dead. Or sorry, Moses is aid. Moses, my servant is dead. Now then you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them to the Israelites. Not much of a funeral there, eh? Not much time to grieve there. God says right at the beginning, Moses, my servant, he's dead. Joshua, lead them to the promised land. Lead my people to the promised land. Incredible. Well, Israel was half a million strong. And all of a sudden, they're grieving over Moses. And all of a sudden, God says, okay, stop, grie stop grieving over what's not here and start looking at what you have. I'm installing a new leader, Joshua. Joshua hasn't done anything. He hasn't led. He was Moses' aide, so they knew about him. But Joshua has not led. Now, all of a sudden, Israel, and they're about to go into the promised land after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, after 40 years of being disciplined by God, they're now about to do one of the greatest exploits they've ever had as a nation. Remember, they went into Egypt as, as a family of 70, Jacob's family, Jacob, Israel, who was, who was later named Israel. Israel's family, they went into Egypt 70 strong, and they came out of Egypt through the Red Sea with Moses, whom they trusted implicitly by now, they, they brought them out and they haven't really done, they had a few wars, but they haven't taken any land. And now Moses is dead and they're going to do the greatest exploit. They're going to take over many nations in Canaan, many peoples in Canaan to, to take over the promised land and they have to do it under a new leader. So what does God do? He gives Joshua one of the greatest trials of his life. He's only seen this happen one more, once before. The Jordan River is in flood season. Israel, half a million, have to get over the Jordan to get to where God is sending them. It's in flood season. So what does God do, Joshua? I want you to get your priests, and I want you to get them to dip their feet to start to walk through the Jordan, even though it's in flood. And Joshua, this is his test. His test as a leader that came through trial. With the Jordan in flood, this trial in front of him, God is about to promote Joshua. The priests dip their toes into the Jordan and instantly it, it stops. And they walk around and, and walk through, and here's the amazing thing, not just in muddy waters because the Jordan had just stopped. They walk across on dry land. And they're all looking, they see the wall of water. My goodness. They get on the other side and they look at Joshua. They go, we didn't think when you when you told us to go through the river, we thought you were hearing voices. But now we know that you're hearing from God. And they followed him implicitly. The next thing they would do is walk around the walls of Jericho. A crazy thing, seven times. You know, the arrows could be shooting down. No, seven times. And then we're gonna see the walls come tumbling down. They followed Joshua through crazy, crazy exploits. And it all started with a trial. Is God promoting you? Is God promoting you? Your trial, because people are watching, will, what will you do with this? What will you do with this trial? Will you crumble under it? Or will, will God, will, will you seek him for a miracle? And through that trial, will you see yourself, your God promoting you so that people will follow you 
walking in the ways of the Lord. Another thing a trial will do is it'll tear something out of you that shouldn't have been there to begin with. Whether it's doubt or fear or pride. I've preached on Joseph so many times. And from chapters 37 to 50 of Genesis, you have the story of Joseph. And it starts out with this little snot-nosed kid. with his, He was daddy's favorite with this Technicolor dream coat. I guess it wasn't called Technicolor in Genesis, technically. <laughs> but he's got this coat of many colors, daddy's favorite. And he'd walk around with that coat. Hi, brothers. Hi, brothers. Hey, I had a dream. We were all represented. We all had sheaths of wheat. And all of a sudden, all of your sheaths of wheat bowed down to mine. Hmm. <laughs> they didn't like it. The brothers didn't like it, and they reacted. But did that stop them? Hey, guys, I had another dream. This time, I was a star. And the sun and the moon and 11 other stars bowed down to me. And you know what he was saying? It wasn't just you guys. It was mom and dad, too. So they threw him in a pit and sold him into slavery. And that was better than the first, the first thing. They wanted to kill him. It was so intense. The hatred was so intense. So Joseph gets, into, gets sold into slavery into Potiphar's house. Potiphar's the head of the prison in, uh, in Egypt. And Joseph rises to the top. When he's confronted by, by Potiphar's wife, he says, there's nothing in in your husband's household that isn't under my control and under my care, except for you, of course. Pride, proud little kid. <coughs> so she, she gets rubbed the wrong way, Potiphar's wife, and claims that he raped her, and Potiphar gets furious and throws, throws Joseph into prison. Well, what does Joseph do? rises to the top of the prison it says the the guard the head of the prison didn't care didn't think about anything that was going on in the prison because he was so secure with joseph's care of everybody in the prison well that doesn't help the ego very much but you know and so all these trials joseph keeps rising to the top keeps rising to the top and it was because of of his it was because of his tenacity for sure, but there was pride in his tenacity. And God knew if he was gonna promote him that he needed to get rid of that pride. If he was truly, well, watch this. So the cup baker and the, and the, and the cup bearer, so the baker and the cup bearer are in prison with Joseph. They were both in the king's court. Well, the baker has this dream that he's well joseph interprets the dreams i can't remember the dreams exactly but the cupbearer was going to be released and go back into the into pharaoh's court but the baker was going to be released and executed well joseph says to, to the cup baker would you remember me when you get in to pharaoh's court again and see if you can do something about my situation well all that came to pass but the cup baker forgot about joseph for two years now there's there is something that when joseph answers so the cup baker and the baker come to joseph and and they said we had these dreams and they're terrible listen to listen to even the hint of pride in Joseph, after all, all that he's gone through, slavery and imprisonment, we both had dreams, they answered, but there is no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, do not interpret belong to God. Tell me your dreams. He's almost in the same breath. The interpretations belong to God. Tell me your dreams. Almost like he's calling himself God. Don't interpretations belong to God. Tell me your dreams. It's forgotten for two years. Pharaoh ends up having a, a dream that, that disturbed him. The cupbaker remembers. There's a guy in prison. And he interpreted my dreams, and, and my dream, and, he, and here I am. It came to pass. He can interpret dreams. So Pharaoh brings Joseph in, says, I've had a dream. Can you interpret it? Now listen to what Joseph says. This is Genesis chapter 41, verse 16. I cannot do it. 
<laughs> We've gotten somewhere. But God. I cannot do it. But God. God had to. So Joseph now in that instance becomes second in command of Egypt, the most powerful nation in the known world at the time. Later, there would be a famine, and thanks to Joseph's administration, they had stored up all of their grains for seven years because through, through prophecy, Joseph told Pharaoh, we need to save it up because there's gonna be a famine in seven years and we're gonna need it. And all the other nations are gonna come to us, by the way, could be a little lucrative. And that's exactly what happened. But what's, what, was, what was one of the nations? Jacob and his family and the boys. And if God had promoted Joseph to second in command to rescue the known world, by the way, through from this famine, if he hadn't used those trials to rip out his pride, he would have never accepted his brothers when they came begging for bread. If that pride was not, a, instead Joseph wept and wept and wept because he, because God had taken him through trial after trial after trial to rip that out of him. And if they didn't do that, then the 12 tribes of, of Israel are no longer. And now we don't have an Old Testament and we don't have a King David and we don't have a Jesus. You're just a cog in the wheel, but a very important cog in the wheel, all of you. And you got a part to play and God may be putting you through hell. And you need to ask, ask, ask God quite often. I'll say, I know I'm going through this. Um, it's brought me to faith. You may be promoting me. I don't know. Well, do you know what? Look, look at what happened to me, what got me here. God had to rip a church out of my grip to get me into the streets of my city. And that's, that was a promotion. Because I will say there's no other, there, and I'm not saying the other pastors in the church or in the city are not concerned about the homeless or drug situation that we have. But they're all tied up the way I was. They're bound by the church, by keeping the church system going. And, and this, is, this is what I had to buy some fruit trays this morning and dive into the word. And I've been in the streets of the city. There's no other pastor that's in the streets of the city because they can't. This was a promotion. And, I, and the whole time I remember saying, God, so be it. So be it. Earlier this week, I'm repenting right now. I got a phone call out of the blue. Well, it wasn't out of the blue. It was, it was preceded by about 40 or 50 texts. Uh, and I didn't handle it well. It was somebody accusing me of doing something, of saying something, but then they wouldn't tell me what I said. And so I, 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 I said, okay. And so I'm going through, I said, do I have to go through the text to see if you, you, you gave it? And I'm getting more and more frustrated. The other thing is, here, now here's my, here's my preamble. My excuses, but we can't have excuses. I had been listening to the news for about two hours about Israel. And I was going back from the Christian Broadcasting Network to Fox News and just at YouTube was just through the algorithm was just bouncing me through. I just had my headphone on, didn't have my phone on me. It was on a charger. So it was just, just right. and it was going back and forth between the rhetoric of, and I was getting more and more mad. Then I got this phone call. I was also sleep deprived because this was, this was a Friday morning and I'd spent two nights babysitting 15 puppies. And I was, I'm strong, do I have to do, and, and, and I'm hearing, you know, I trusted you, and boy, you're, you're, you're two-faced, and you're, and I'm getting all these, and I said, well, what did I do? No, I'm not getting into that, and I lost it on him. And afterwards, <laughs> no. and afterwards I went, oh, Cooper, 
you're an idiot. You let him, but you, you let him take, you know, you gave him authority over your feelings. And in that moment, I realized that I, that I, and you're going to be surprised at this because I give, I put my best foot forward on Sundays and Wednesdays, but I still have a temper. You can ask my kids. I have a temper. Don't piss me off. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'll, I'll edit that. I, you know, but that is something, and it took that trial to show me something. And I'm very aware now that I got something I need to take to the Lord. I need to calm down. Let your gentleness be evident to all. And if you're watching, I'm sorry. I truly am. Uh, so trials can tear something out of you or expose something in you. All right, let's keep on going. Trials can help you relate to others. Simon, Simon, Jesus said. Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you, Simon. I'm just seeing something new for the first time. Simon, Simon, Satan, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. Have you ever seen that before? All of you as wheat. But I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. Now, what Jesus is referring to, I think, is when he goes on the cross, all of the disciples scatter except for John, who sticks around with Mary at the foot of the cross. All of them scatter. Satan is sifting them like wheat. Sift, 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 sift. And, and all the disciples scatter. And Peter betrays him three times and mourns. But then when we see them turn back, when we see them three days later in the upper room and Jesus comes and says, here, here, let me show you. I'm back, baby. Peter becomes the first powerhouse. He's the first sermon in the book of Acts comes from Peter walking out of the upper room filled with the Holy Spirit into the crowds of bewildered people and saying, let me tell you what's, what's up. Jesus died and rose again and you too can be saved. Took the trial. Took the betrayal. Took the, I followed you. For three years, I left my career. I, I haven't spent time with my family, my wife, my mother-in-law. That's the family that we know biblically anyway that Peter had and was responsible for. I left them. At one point we see Peter saying to Jesus, I've, we've left all this for you. And Jesus answered, listen, it's going to be worth it. But it took Peter hitting rock bottom. You know that there's no resurrection without a death, don't you? We all want to share in the resurrection of Jesus. But as Philippians chapter 3 says, I got to share in your suffering. And I mean, the emblem of Christianity, have you noticed? It's an execution tool. It's a cross. If, if it was a guillotine, we'd all be wearing guillotines around our neck. <laughs> but it's not. It's not. You, you can help you relate to others. Crystal and what she has been through in her life, through abuse of all kinds, on every level, she can relate. And if you listen to her podcast, Confessions of, of a Pastor's Wife, she can relate on a level that I can't to people who are going through pain. Now, one thing I can relate to, and it was part of my Bible college to get into the streets of the city, but it wasn't in a Bible college. I was on welfare. My parents had moved to Calgary, had a brother in Tennessee, had another one uh, in Toronto, and I found myself in Niagara Falls all alone. That's a whole other testimony. God tricked me, got me out there. Uh, and then I had no church, no friends, no, I had a little part-time job, 
I actually know this is before the part-time job. Of course, I was on welfare. And here I am, I got an apartment and no way to pay for it. So I hit the streets. Not the streets, I mean, I started knocking on doors. Found a factory. And this, this guy says, listen, I'd love to take you. you. You're a young man with ambition, but I can't. You got to be on the manpower program. I said, how do I do that? So, well, you got to go to, and it was the, it was the unemployment office back then. We're now politically correct. It's the employment office. So I went to the unemployment office, which was on the other, it was, I think it was Fort Erie. So I'm now the south of the peninsula in Niagara, Niagara Peninsula. And I, I, I'm standing in line, you know, this cocky young man, 21 years old. And I, I uh, got up to the kiosk and I said, listen, I don't, I don't need any, I got a job. I just, you, I want to be put on the manpower program. Oh, well, you got to be on welfare. And it was called welfare back then, yeah. people. Not Ontario Works. When they're not working, go to the employment office when you're not employed. Anyway, I digress. It's a very positive spin. So I drive up to St. Catharines, the whole way going, welfare. Okay. I st I'm standing in line at the welfare office, this 21 year old kid. I, I don't belong here. I got, I, got a, I got a job offer. I got a job offer, I just need to get on the program. I get up to the kiosk after standing in line and I'm sure God's just going, ah, I'm ripping something out of you, Chris. I get up to the, and I said word for word, I don't need your money. I just need to be put on the welfare program so I can get on the manpower program. And I got a job lined up, mm -hmm. and, but they need their, their quota of manpower employees. Well, sir, that's not the way it goes. You're going to have to get an interview. We need to see your bank statements and everything. I said, well, my bank statement will show you I need welfare. <laughs> so let's go. And so, but I had to go through the whole interview and I ended up being on welfare because I got on welfare, got on the manpower program. And I went back to that guy and he said, sorry, no positions available. And so here I am, my little apartment in Font Hill, Ontario, on welfare, looking for a job. I've been there, folks. And God put me there so that I'd remember. You know, and God does this all the time. You go back to Exodus, and you have Moses up on the mountain getting the books of the law, getting all this download from God. Meanwhile, Israel's down there being led by his brother Aaron as a proxy because Moses is up with a meeting with God. And Aaron's down there, got everybody stripped naked, and they're dancing around a golden calf. Moses comes down, drops the Ten Commandments, breaks them. What is going on here? Later, Aaron will be promoted as the high priest. Aaron, strip, strip buck naked, leading everybody dancing around a calf while God's getting a download so that when people would come to the temple with their sacrifice, Aaron, with all the clothes that God, God ordained, God dressed the priests. It's all in the books of the law. With, with the sash and with Aaron, he'd be there at the temple gates to receive the sacrifice. But because of what God brought, allowed Aaron to go through, Aaron would never look at any of them and go, I'm better than you. That's the high priest that God would have. And trials, that's what brings it through. God uses trials to maneuver you. Nobody likes a closed door until the right door opens. And then you look back at all of those closed doors and think, thank you, God. It's kind of like dating. <laughs> she broke up with me. She broke up with me. She broke up with me until you find the right one. Then you feel like writing cards to everybody. I just want to thank you so much for walking away from me because you led me to the right open door. <laughs> but they were trials. Those breakups were trials, weren't they? 
You thought you were going to die. You got rejected from this job and that job and this job and that job. You got rejected from this school and that school until all of a sudden God said, you don't need a school and, and gave you a career. That was, that was Levi, my son. Didn't go to college or university. He's got a great career. Toyota makes more money than I do. God said, Jesus said in Revelation, I open and close doors that no man can do otherwise. And you aren't at the mercy of closed doors. Closed doors are you being at the mercy of God. You got to see it different. These have come so that your faith, which is not by sight, we walk by faith, not by sight. You see it. You see the tapestry of the word. I was really taken a couple weeks ago when I was looking at Hebrews five, when we was doing from milk to meat, and essentially saying we need to grow up. But if you've just first come to the Lord, you need to just enjoy the milk, and don't worry. It said there that Jesus was perfected through suffering. He was perfected through suffering until he said, not my will, but yours be done. I'm not saying yet at all. Jesus was perfect. He was sinless, but he still needed the, the all man needed to be perfected. I don't exactly know what that means, but he needed to be perfected in obedience. And the garden of Gethsemane was one of the biggest trials. I, I you know, I, I, Jesus may correct me, but I think the Garden of Gethsemane was tougher than being on the cross. Sometimes anticipating what's going to happen is harder than when it's actually happened. That's what I mean. I mean, the heartache and the pain, you know, when you're anticipating something happening and it's killing you. Sometimes it's harder to move towards something to that date than to actually have it happen. But in that waiting for it to happen and fighting with God, wrestling with God three times, is there any other way? Father, is there any other way? Is there any other way? He was perfected in the trial when he said, not my will, but yours be done. And he went to the cross. It took a trial to do that. To perfect your Savior, it took a trial. Don't think that you're going to be <laughs> a void of the same idea. Okay, we're almost there. Trials keep your eyes on God. It's kind of like the first point of, of, of uh, faith. These have come so that your faith, it, it brings you to God. It gets you paying attention again. Jehoshaphat, when he had the two armies coming, that's in Second Chronicles 20, he had the two armies coming. I think about this all the time, and I love it when I hear you folks quote it. It happened just a couple weeks ago. Joshua said, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. And that's why it came. That's why the armies came against you. That's why that thing that's bigger than what you can do come, comes to you so that you'll finally stop doing it yourself, stop doing life yourself, and say, "My, this is bigger than me. I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. And God says, finally, this free will thing is killing me. Finally. Here's my answer to you. The battle's not yours. It's mine. Don't worry about this vast army that's coming at you. Keep your eyes on me. I do want you to go out and face the army. I thought you said the battle wasn't mine. That's easier for you to say up there. No. Because you going to face the army shows me that you have faith purpose in the trial see God wants all of you he wants he wants all of you but he wants all of you he wants a hundred percent of you and trials do it let's face it trials do it 
what do all of those things that I just said have in common? They produce faith. Not faith in your faith, but faith in God. Faith that He can. Faith that He's able. Have you just crumbled and said, I, I don't know if God can. That's, that is abusing the trial. Because the trial came, the purpose of the trial was to produce faith. And if you say, I don't know if God can, you're abusing the trial. Teaching you to trust him and to guide you. How many times does God have to come through before the next trial you go, we got this. Because this isn't your first trial, folks. It's not your first rodeo. And I know that you're okay because you're sitting around this table eating fruit. Faith that he may just be promoting you so that others will lead. One of my greatest credentials out on the streets is that I was booted from a church. You know that? And all of a sudden they go, well, I always introduce myself as a pastor that, that just, I struggle with church churches yeah me too every time every time and that's not to bash churches because churches are needed for a certain group of people but there's a certain other group of people that don't get it and it's like fire and ice like oil and water and that's that's who i'm called to so it's certainly not not to bash the good that's happening in churches it's just not for the group that i'm called for and one of the greatest credentials is when they find out that I was a forced resignation. Faith, just, I have faith that God promoted me. Faith that he's promoting you. Faith that he's tearing something out of you, like a temper. <laughs> faith that he's helping you to help relate to others so that they will trust you to guide them to Jesus. Faith that he's maneuvering you to the right thing. Again, I think most of the things we call trials is God going, no, not that, not that. But I really want this plate. I know, but it's empty. I want you to have this cup because it's full. But I like that plate until you drink for the cup. Oh, I like this better than the plate. I knew you would. Faith, faith, purpose in the trials. Faith that he's teaching you to keep your eyes on him. Faith that he's working all things for the good that are called according to your purpose. Oops, I quoted that wrong. Faith that he's working all things out according to his purpose. You are in his story, folks. He's not in your story. You're in his story. You know what I mean by that. It's... It's about your part to play in God's story. Okay, now let's go deeper and then we'll close. Faith comes to keep your earthly purpose, your earthly purpose, your all-encompassing global earthly purpose in focus. Go back to, to 1 Peter chapter 1. And we're going to look at the verses around this, the, our text this morning. 1 Peter chapter 1. But I want to look at verse 3 and be ready to have your minds blown. You got it? First Peter chapter 1. I told you to put a thumbtack in it anyway. First Peter chapter 1 verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's your salvation, right? Jesus died and rose again. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord. In his great mercy, he's given us salvation. Verse 4. And into an inheritance. The, these are the promises. If you go to the book of Revelation and look at the, the, the letters to the seven churches. All of the promises for not your earthly future, but for your heavenly for the new not even your heavenly future the new heaven and new earth that's your inheritance that's what's being referred to here now watch this 
into an inheritance. So the new heaven, new earth that can never perish, spoil, or fade. In other words, once you get through this science project and you pass on, there's no more tests. There's no more trials. That's exciting. That's your inheritance. But you got to get through all of this stuff first and come out. And here's how. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who, through faith, are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation. In other words, that's the escaping of this world, believing in Jesus Christ. And not just believing him for your salvation, but believing him in faith. Who, let's read verse 5 again. Who through faith are shielded. What's shielded? The inheritance. What's your inheritance? Getting out of this project, out of this life, into the new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem. That's your inheritance. And that inherent, inheritance is being kept in heaven for you and is being shielded by God's power through what? Your faith. And so all those things that faith does, that's why God's putting you through all of this. All the trials, the purpose of trials is to increase your... So in all this, verse 6, in all this you greatly rejoice. Your inheritance, it's being, it's being protected and shielded by God's power in heaven. And that is happening. And, and the power source of that is your faith. Now, in all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to have had to suffer gr griefs in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even through though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. The purpose in trials, did you catch that? The purpose in your trials is to produce faith, which is unlocking God's power to shield your inheritance, which is in heaven, which guarantees your standing in the new heaven and new earth. That's mind boggling. That's why your trial needs to produce faith. Consider it pure joy when you go through trials of all kinds Whew. that's mind-boggling i've never i i caught that late last night as i was doing my final study for this and i went i can't wait for people to get here that is unbelievable talk about can, can i just let me just i'm going to say in closing 1 Corinthians 3, it just reminded me of this. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. That's salvation. That's our foundation. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, copper,